Amen, amen. Can we give it up for our worship team? Love you guys. I also want to uh, take this moment just to give it up too for Levi Weaver. If you guys could give Levi Weaver. If you guys were, if you guys were here last week, uh, you heard an incredibly powerful testimony from Levi Weaver. He's one of our youth leaders, does such a great job with our youth. And if, uh, I just want to say this, if you were not here last Sunday, and I should say this about every Sunday, and we do. If you were not here last Sunday, please, please go to our YouTube channel, go to Facebook, and find BC. Find Levi Weaver's testimony from last week, and, uh, and please watch that testimony. I know it's been just received so well. We've heard from people even just sharing that with other people uh, who aren't part of BC, and we love that when we share our messages um, and certainly do that more often. But please, if you did not get a chance to see that, uh, please check that out. Hey, before I uh, welcome out Bat. Today, I want to just uh, acknowledge Sean and Renee and the family took a little vacation this week, something they haven't been able to do for quite some time, so we're excited for them just to have a little downtime. But he did want, even already sent me a message just saying, hey, I'm so pumped already for next week. He's already so pumped for next week and just getting back into his wisdom series. And so uh, Sean misses you. I know Renee misses you, and they're certainly going to miss Seek tonight. But, uh, but please be here for tonight. Be here for Seek. But I want to bring Al Bat up here. Most of you guys know Al Bat. Uh, love Al Bat. He's a big part of BC, actually on staff at Believer's Chapel as a care pastor. And in that, even in that title, please know this, that, Sean, that uh, Al's heart is just so much towards, honestly, caring for other people. And even before COVID craziness, uh, spent a lot of time in the hospitals visiting with people, people he didn't even know, people who just signed up for pastoral care. And Al Bat would be right there by their bedside. Uh, spends a lot of time, even along with his wife, Phyllis, spends a lot of time in people's homes. And so please, if you have that need. And if you'd like to have some time with Al Bat, I know he's oftentimes up here praying for folks after services. He's got these amazing little cards you can fill out uh, to get to get in contact with Al. But Al, love you. Thank you for being such a big part of BC. Amen. Privileged to call you a friend, fellow farmer, fellow farmer. So he's always helped me get out of a jam when I uh, when I have problems at the at the Kolb farm. But uh, Al, thank you for being here today. We are privileged to have you uh, on staff at BC. And uh, thank you for being here, my friend. Thank you, sir. Love you, man. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. Um, I want to share a couple of things. I did speak to Sean last night on the phone. He uh, called me like three or four times, and finally I checked my phone, and I see the messages, and I returned my, his call. And uh, he wanted me to tell you that he loves you folks. I mean, you, you mean the world to him. That goes without saying. I know that you know that. Very evident. Um, Sean and I go back quite a ways. Um, he doesn't go back as far as I do. <laughs> but... Uh, when he and I was... You know, lay pastors together. I used to, I, I'm an early guy. I get up early and I show up at church. If it's in the winter, I'm scraping the walks. But in the winter, I would see snow tracks to the chapel. And so I, I just knew it was Sean. And I'd go in and he would be on his face in the front of the church, his Bible open in front of him crying out to God. He said to me one day, he said, Al, I, I, I've got a tremendous burden for families, young and old, and I want to make an impact in this area. And I've never forgot that. That's Sean. And he wanted me to tell you, make sure you tell them how much I love them and how much I'm looking forward to, to, to be back after, you know, my, my time away. And so I, I, I extend his love and his care for you in that respect. A couple of things that I needed to talk about really quickly before we get started. Uh, obviously, September 12th is a church picnic, and there will be a baptismal service. If anyone here wants to be baptized, if God's stirring your heart, uh, go online, register, see Teresa out at the desk. Uh, baptism, you know, you, you may ask a couple questions. Does baptism save? No. 
It doesn't save. Baptism is, follows salvation. Baptism is obedience to God's call on your life. I'm not saying he's, to be baptized doesn't mean you've got to go to Africa or be an evangelist. No, it means you are identifying with Christ. The death, burial, and resurrection is, is a picture of what Christ has done for you and me. If you want to be baptized, as God is stirring your heart, I encourage you that you come and get registered and be baptized. Another thing I wanted to speak about is a little bit about the hospital visitation ministry. Um, because of the, the HEPA laws and because of the complications brought on by the pandemic, the COVA, I haven't been in a hospital for months. Also, uh, I no longer can get the information sheet if someone's in a hospital. It's ridiculous, but it has to be. And, and they are under the gun because of the HEPA laws. They have to comply, and it's not their fault. However, and this is educational, if you or a loved one end up in the hospital, from the inside, if you request, I want Pastor Sean, I want Pastor Al to visit me during my stay, I can come in. And they cannot stop me because it's, it's, it's been prearranged. You may have a loved one. You may have a spouse, and you're the spokesman. I want Al Bath to come and visit. Now, you can't have both of us. It's got to be one or the other. But one person, one clergy can come in. I want you to know that. Uh, I no longer have access to know who is in the hospital. It's up to you. If a loved one is there, you have to tell me. At least I can sit in the parking lot, call them, and pray with them in their room. It, a lot relies on you for me to know and do my job. And then thirdly, I wanted to speak briefly about the prayer ministry. As you know, at the end of each service, there are folks that are over here that will pray with anyone that has concerns. And I want you to be able to come concerning anything. Now, we've had some blessings. I just did a funeral yesterday, Ruby and Lisa Miller. Ruby and uh, Lisa Miller's mom, Joan, uh, about two weeks ago, they came up. And they said, uh, Al, and some of you were involved in this situation. My mom is terminally ill. She's going to pass away. And, and we prayed. We cried together. And I said to, I said to Lisa, I said, let's, let's make some arrangements. Tell me when she's going to be home from the hospital. We got to know. Let me know, and I'll drive up, and we'll, do, see, we'll see what we can do. And I, long story short, and I want to have time for our message today out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, but I want to hurry along here. She accepted the Lord two days before she passed. I don't know if Phil Nelson is here. Phil came forward, and he, he said, Al, I, I've injured my back. I suppose it was impairing his ability to perform at work. And he came forward, and I laid my hands on his shoulders, and we prayed. He came up the next Sunday, shining, radiant. Al, the pain's gone. I, I, I'm great. I'm back to work. Everything's all right. Listen. <laughs> Kenneth came to me, and I, I don't want to say Kenneth's last name because I'll destroy it. Because anyhow, Kenneth came to me, and he was concerned about a very, very close friend who was in the hospital under a serious situation. And it was one of those cases. I could not go to the hospital to pray with this person. I couldn't call them. I, they weren't able to even answer the phone. And I said, Kenneth... 
the responsibility apparently lies on you. You've got to speak to your friend. You, you, Kenneth, here's what you've got to do. And I am in a crash course. And he won her to the Lord. He went in and she prayed and received Jesus. That's the prayer ministry over here, folks. And so I want to encourage you to, to utilize it and to be a part of it. If you've got a, a need and you need someone to pray with you, please come. Now today we're going to be looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And uh, Levi, I love Levi. He's an awesome, he, he's a hard act to follow. Uh, he come to me today and he says, Al, you want me to give you some jokes? I said, no. <laughs> I want to, <laughs> I want to read out of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and then I want to go back over and critique some verses and just tell you some experiences I have. We're looking at the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the lives of each and every one of us. If you're a born-again believer, Jesus is in your heart. You've been saved. The very first thing that occurs is the Holy Spirit comes in and sets up housekeeping. He's in there. He's working. Uh, a lot of times, he's very quiet. He's very still. He is a still, small voice. And you've got to learn, if anything else, learn and be sensitive to know when the Holy Spirit's speaking to you. Become accustomed to it. It's fascinating. It's, fa it's supernatural. Paul speaking to us. He's speaking to the believers in Corinth. There's a variety of subjects, but the general subject is Christian conduct. Christian conduct is big as far as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God. If he's in there, your conduct's going to be right on line. Paul speaks to us. He says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. How many of you can relate to that? Boy, I, I'm coming. I, I don't have wisdom and excellency of speech. And, and I, I don't have these abilities. You know, I've got my old little New Testament here. It's literally worn out. And when I, when, when I used to go to talk to people about the Lord early on in my life. I was a nervous wreck. I'd say, it, it, it says right here, if you will confess with your... And, and I think people got saved because they felt sorry for me. <laughs> Paul says, I came not with excellency of speech, but a wisdom declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How be it? We speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. And of course, that is, Paul said, Christ in you, the hope of glory which none of the princes of this world knew. Had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. I always say in verse 8, the devil shot himself in the foot. He would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. But God has revealed them to us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yet the deep... In, uh, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knows no man. 
but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of this world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but what the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because he's spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. I like verse 16 in conclusion. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The Holy Spirit is literally the very person of Jesus Christ who has come in and put up, made up his abode in you. Now, Paul opens up, I, brethren, I came to you not with the excellency of speech or in wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. You know, Paul laid aside all of his oratorical abilities and all of his eloquence of speech, and he just simply preached Jesus. Just simply preached Jesus. I've learned in many situations that I found myself in to just preach Jesus and keep it simple, keep it to the point. You know, you're not talking to people that are theologically sound. You're talking to people that sometimes it's the first time around. I'll, I'll, I'll never forget old Gordon, 97 years of age. I don't mean Gordon Scott. You kind of look like you could be 97, but... <laughs> But Gordon, you know, and I don't recall all that transpired that I met Gordon. I think I was going to visit the patient in the bed next to him, and the gentleman was, uh, had already been discharged. So I do what I always do. I go to the next person. And, and I struck up a conversation with Gordon, 97 years of age, used to be, he was the past superintendent of schools in Olean. And I, I, I've done funerals for people in their 70s that knew him as a student, but um, we stuck up a conversation, and I always talk about the Lord. I always witness, and I always share a few verses, and I pray, and I did, and you know, at 97, there was no one left. I mean, he didn't have no colleagues or anything like that. I, mean, I think he had a daughter, one daughter, and she was in her 70s. And, and the guy was just, I mean, alone. And so I, I kind of took a, a, attached to him and, and would pray with him. And one day I went to the hospital and he wasn't there. So I found out that they had shipped him to Cuba. And he was in what you would call, I believe, comfort care. So I went up, down the hall, made a left turn, into the room. Hi, Gordon. And the first thing he said to me, he was sitting up in his bed. He looked into my face, and he was troubled. He says, Al, I'm not ready. Well, I, I knew, I knew in the Holy Spirit what was going on. But I wanted to hear it from him. Gordon, what do you mean? Al, I'm not ready to die. And I said, well, we can fix that right now. And he, tears running down his eyes, he accepted the Lord. Took me by the hand, prayed, and accepted the Lord. And I left that day down the hall, tears in my eyes, tears of joy. But I knew that possibly I wouldn't see him again. I came back. I always like to follow up on people. When I lead them to the Lord, I come back. I review. Now, do you remember when we did this? Remember this verse? Now, who were you talking to? And so forth. If they say, well, I was talking to you. We, we, no, nope, let's go over this again. Who were you talking to? Well, I was talking to the Lord Jesus. That's right. I'm just a messenger. And I went back to review, and I turned into his room, and the room was just perfect. You could have bounced a quarter off the bed. I looked around and there were no personal effects. I knew that in the night he had passed. Back down the hall, tears in my eyes, but with the hope I knew 
Someday I'll see Gordon in heaven. Paul said in verse 3, he says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Paul had a physical weakness, plus he lived literally in fear and trembling. There were times when the Holy Spirit of God would have to speak to Paul and say, Look at, look at, it's going to be all right. No one's going to hurt you this time. Acts 18, 9 and 10 says, Then spoke the Lord to Paul in the night, Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. How many times do we hold back? We're afraid. How many times? Even I struggle with that sometimes. I learned one thing. When you're, there's a group of men, you talk about the weather. When it's one-on-one, -on -one, it's just you and them. Then you talk about the Lord. There are some tricks to the trade, so to speak. He said, he said no one's going to hurt you. I'm going to be with you. No man will set on you to hurt you. Well, I remember years ago, uh, an undertaker clear out toward uh, friendship called me, and I connected the dots, and, and an undertaker in, in Bowler gave him my name, and so he called me and said, hey, I got a family here. I, I need someone to do a funeral. Can you do it? I said, sure. And I'm telling you, there's some dandy people that come down out of some of these hills around here. I'm telling <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> I said to the undertaker, look, I want the address and the phone number of these people. I want to visit them. I always visit them before the funeral. I try to, you know... Get them to be comfortable with me. Plus, I find out a little bit about their background and such and, and uh, make them to be comfortable. And I always, I, I work the gospel in there. I tell them, well, this is how I do funerals. So we did. And uh, so the widow and her two daughters were with her. And there were other members of the family that were not able to be there. So I didn't know this. So... I come to the, do the funeral, and I always come early and mill with the people and get them to be comfortable, pick up maybe a story about the deceased and so on. And I'm kind of with the people, and I see this big guy off in the corner, and he was always staring at me. And I started getting a little bit, a little bit uneasy. And uh, kind of, he was a big guy, like Dan the Man back there, Gunswick. Guns, however I say your name, but Dan, the man, it's like Dan was handsome. This guy was, you know, we won't go there. And he just kept staring at me, and he was condescending, and he, he looked down at me. And what well, just before I was to step up and speak, he said to me, Look at here, preacher. We ain't religious folk, and don't you go do no preaching, and you keep it short. Here? I'm already kind of a nervous guy, and just scrawny me, and he was a big dude. Uh, I, what am I going to do? And so I stepped, and I just went through the whole thing, and I shared the message of the gospel. I mean, it went remarkably well. And, and, and people's attention was incredible. And at the end, I, I, I closed and I, I led people in a prayer if they chose to pray. And I began to back away into a foyer area and people began to mill and pay the last respects. I looked down a long hall and this door opened and that guy filled the doorway. And here he come. I thought, boy, this guy is gonna, this guy is gonna pummel me. And I'm kind of trying to be inconspicuous, and I'm looking for a door because I'm pretty sure I could outrun him. <laughs> and this is the truth. He came up to me, and he extended his hand. And in a soft, compassionate, genuine voice, he said, Al, thank you. I believe the guy got saved. I really do. I wasn't about to ask him, you know, to leave sleeping dogs fly. <laughs> Paul says in 
verses 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That's where it is, folks. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's the Holy Spirit in us. Some some years ago, and I've been a long time, and I, I've, to, I've told this story before, and, and I will say this, old stories are good. They are. They, good, they incite interest. They become contagious. I, I hope that today, right now, people here are saying, man, I wish I could win people to the Lord. Man, I, I think that'd be cool to have the Holy Spirit guiding my life. That, that's the idea of old stories. Old stories are good so long as you got new ones coming on. Can't rely on the old all the time. You've got to have new stuff happening in your life. And, I, and time permitting, I might be able to share a couple of them. So anyhow, he said, my speech was not with enticing words. Several years ago, I was here in Olean doing something, making calls and visits and such, and Dave Hearn called me. Hey, Al, where are you at right now? I said, I'm in Olean. Listen, can you go to Cuba? There's a gentleman there. I just got off the phone with the family. He's in a really bad way. He's going to die. And the family is just in tears. They're, they're a wreck. They've tried to win him to Christ, and he constantly shuts them down. He tells them, you know, I'm not do it. End it. Don't want to talk about it. Will you go see him? I said, sure. So I went. I drove, hit 86, broke the speed limit. Not really. All the way up to Cuba, exited, crossed town to the hospital, up, down the hall, and made a left turn. I mean a right turn. I'm sorry. A left turn right across the hall where Gordon got saved. Right across the hall. And I walked in, and I started making discussion. One in that I had is I knew his son. We, were fr we happened to be friends, and so I just kind of talked about his son. And, boy, you've got a great son, and this and that, and wow, and so forth. And, and finally he says, yeah, when I'm gone, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him my, my, my fishing boat. He's, he's like Tom up there. He was a, they were fishermen. They loved the lakes and the streams. And, and I'm going to, when I'm gone... And I says, Lou, when you're gone, where are you going to spend eternity? And he shut immediately. I don't want to talk about it. And I thought, well, yep, sure enough, they weren't kidding. He shut them right down. And I do not know. Well, I do know what come over me. It was the Holy Spirit of God. Because I looked at him and I says, look at Lou. And then I walked around the foot of the bed and I got right up close to him. It's time for you to sit up like a man. Face reality. You're close to death. It's just around the corner and your family's worried about you. And I immediately put my hand up. <gasps> what? In my mind, I was saying, Al, what? you can't do that to a dying man. You're... You're going to drive him away. He'll never get saved. And I looked down, the man began to weep uncontrollably. I said, Lou, just take me by the hand. Settle the matter. He had prayed and invited Jesus into his heart. That night, his son calls me, Al, my dad is unbelievable. He, he, he said to me, he looked up into my face. He said, son, I feel great. I can't believe it. He said, everything's all right. It's okay. I can go now. And he went home to be with Jesus. He went home to be with the Lord. Paul says, he says in verse 6, Howbeit we speak among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world to come to, it comes to naught. Last Monday, we had a little get-together, fellowship, food, games, fun. You know, when you're with believers, you talk about things differently than you do when you're amongst or in the world, and you see how they are. Uh, we talk, he said, when he says, 
Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. I'm talking differently today because I'm speaking to people that are perfect. What I mean perfect, you're under the blood of Christ. When God sees you, he sees the finished work of Christ. And we are perfect in his eyes. We know we struggle every day. But God the Father sees you as perfect in his eyes. I need to hurry along here, I can tell. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, verse 7. We speak the word of God in a mystery, even a hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world know. Verse 7, from eternity past, he saw you and I. Now, I want you to get this. As vehicles through which... He could express himself by the power of the Spirit that is in us. From eternity past, from eternity past, he knew that I'd be standing right here and that through the Holy Spirit, he can express his love. Verse 9. But, I, but as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. By the way, that is present today and future when we step across that threshold and we're in the presence of the Lord. Today, present, right now, I has not seen, nor ear heard, neither entered into the heart of man the things that he's prepared for you. And me. Be accustomed to that still small voice so that you can be that vehicle. Be accustomed to it. Know what it is. Experience it. Ask God for it. Jesus said, You know how to good, get good, give good gifts to your children. How much more will I give you the Spirit if you ask? I already have the Spirit, Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm asking because I want a double portion. Ask for the Spirit of God to be active and evident in your life. 9, 10, 10, 11, and 12 says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him. I don't, I don't know what's in your deep spirit, in your very innermost person right now. And you don't know what's in my, you got a lot more, you know a lot more about what's in me right now than I do you. But I don't know what's in your heart. And so he says, even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given us of God. God can give you a heads up. There are times when I knew something was going to happen before it happened. Yeah. Honestly. Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things, Things which are revealed. He may reveal something to you differently than he will to you, but the things that are revealed belong unto us and to our children forever. Don't want to embarrass my daughter, but my daughter right over here led all five of her kids to the Lord. The things revealed belong unto us, to our children forever, that we may do all the words of the law. Are you in the word? Job 32 and verse 8. But there is a spirit in man in the inspiration of the Almighty gives him understanding. That being said, Job 
22, 21. Acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace. Acquaint yourself with him. Ask him for the full work of the Holy Spirit in your life. Some years ago, I, I, I knew this man probably pretty much a good share of my life. But I always, when I saw him, I always pondered him. He was a lawyer. I'd see him maybe at the post office. He didn't know me. I knew him. He knew my family. He had done some legal work for us. And I used to kind of say, deep in my mind's eye, I used to say, Lord, someday, just someday, maybe I'm going to have his audience. Boy, he's a lawyer. I don't know. This might be a tough case. And this has happened more than once. And I, Steve Ado is over here. I love that man. That man has covered me. More times in prayer when I would leave that information desk at the hospital. One day I was looking, viewing the names on the pastoral list, and I saw a name. It was that lawyer. And there was a, I can't describe it, but it was the Holy Spirit of God. It was like a flash right here. Kind of like a mild electric flash. And it has happened more than once. And every time that occurred, someone was either saved or something good happened. Or a miracle occurred. Every time. That day I read and I saw the man's name and it was a flash and I don't know if Steve was there but I, I believe he was there that day I see Steve I ran out went through the doors I didn't take the elevator I ran up two flights of stairs out onto the second floor down the hall got to his room I dressed like him today I got my composure and I stepped in I, I, I said hi and I called him by name he looked up at me in astonishment. His first words were, let me guess, you're from the Federal Bureau of Financing, aren't you? I said, no, you can relax. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to say this. I, he accepted the Lord. I talked to him quite a bit. And he accepted the Lord. He had a terminal situation. I didn't know what it was. I never really talked about it, but he accepted the Lord. And I, like I said to you, I always tried to come back and review. Now, do you understand what you did? Where are you going to, if you die today, where are you going to go? I'm going to go to heaven. And this is what I wanted to hear. And so... I was reading in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Uh, John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was talking to the church of Pergamos. To him that overcomes, that means to the person that is saved, that is acquitted. I will give to eat of the hidden manna. The hidden manna speaks of the fellowship of the Spirit of God. And I will give him a white stone. And in that stone, a new name. And I took a stone. And I put that man's name on it. I put Revelation 2, verse 17. And I said, and I came back to the hospital. And as I reviewed, I pulled that out of my pocket. And I said, look at he was a, He was a history buff. And he loved that kind of stuff. And I told him about the history of Pergamos. And he said, wow. And I gave him that stone. He was elated. And stayed on his stand in the hospital during his stand. And who knows? 
how many people came and questioned about what is this? A few weeks went by and I stopped by his office and I met the receptionist. We began to talk. He heard my voice. He come running out from out back. Hey, 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 Al, come here, come here, come here. Look at my, come here, into my office. And he put some papers aside. And there was that stone. <laughs> Amen. And it was a few weeks and he was gone. He was gone. Went home to be with Jesus. Well, my time is up. If you want a white stone, I want you to come over here. If you're not saved, if you're not sure that heaven is your home, come over here where we pray and some people will be gathering, those of you that are part of the prayer group. And if you want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, and you want to, so, so to speak, receive a white stone, it says you're acquitted. I only have this stone. This is my illustration today. But if you want to receive Jesus, I want you to come. God bless you. Thank you so much for being so amazingly attentive.